Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. My name is Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post, and Fisherman's Post has been serving the North Carolina saltwater fishing community since 2003, bringing you fishing reports, fishing information, fishing tournaments, fishing schools, and now, in our most recent chapter, bringing you the Saltwater Podcast Series. In this podcast series, we reach out to our captain and guide friends from up and down the North Carolina coast and ask them to share with us their insights, their knowledge on how to catch more fish more often. And not only are we hoping for more fish more often, but we're hoping just for confidence and excitement just to get you to spend more time on the water, more time with your friends and family. I'm joined this week as I am every week with my co-host Billy Thorpe, and that's Billy Thorpe of Thorpe Creative Hey, Billy. What's going on, Gary? Doing all right, man? Well, I'm not doing so good. I, I skipped right over <laughs> telling everyone the title of the show. Uh-oh. I'll, so I'll, so I'm going to backtrack. All right. I'm going to go back to you. And, man, I want you to edit we'll and make like this, me look brilliant. We'll act like this never and happened. make me look brilliant. I'm editing right now. All right. So, Billy, this episode <laughs> is bottom fishing for snappers and triggers. Bottom fishing for snappers and triggers. And talking to... We're talking to Co Captain Cody Garner of Real Time Charters out of Atlantic Beach. And we've got a list of stuff to cover. Um, Cody wants to talk about rod, reel setup, rigs, bait, what to look for, basically the where. And then we're going to talk about feeling the bite and fighting the fish. So we got a lot to talk about. And I'm excited to get to hear what Cody has to say. Sounds good, man. Well, before we get to that, we'll just remind people how to watch and how to listen. Uh, if you're watching, you can see this slide. If you're listening, then you can listen <laughs> to how to, to watch or listen. So we got Spotify, Podbean, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube as well. And as always, Gary, it's really good if people go on there and subscribe and become a part of our community and, you know, just follow, comment, do all those things. Let us know that you're watching the show. You like it. You hate it. We eat feedback for breakfast. Yeah, we want the uh, we love the comments. We want you to start sharing. We want you to get the help us get the word out. We feel like we're on to something good, and you know, hoping to build on it. Absolutely, and it's all made possible in this episode by Marine Warehouse Center. I got a quick video from those guys, and I'll be right back. This is Preston with Marine Warehouse Center. We're your headquarters for Carolina Skiff, Sea Chaser, Prepare Marine, and Sailfish Boat. If you're looking for tons of features and value without compromise. Come check out our inventory in person or check us out online. Some jamming music, man. They are. That's where I'm from. That, that little banjo picking reminds me of home. <laughs> it fit. I like it. I fit. It was good. We like those guys at Marine Warehouse Center. And so what I try to do after every commercial is to come up with something else. And right now I'm on an over-under phase. I have a question for you, Billy. I'm excited. That relates to Marine Warehouse Center. I'm going to give you a number. And you're going to tell me whether or not the answer is over or under the number I'm giving you. I think you understand the concept. Yep. Can I move forward? Yep, let's move. How many years has Marine Warehouse Center been in business in Wilmington? The over-under number is 33. Uh, they've been over over 33 over 33 damn it yes i knew it <laughs> 35 and i think they started out as like a uh, like a go-kart repair place like small engine repair if i thought they were running liquor i thought it was an old bootleg <laughs> <laughs> maybe i don't know <laughs> with, that was the go-kart they were running liquor <laughs> with go-karts go <laughs> that sounds more fun than go-karts i don't know oh gosh man what am i looking for here a, a photo? fish photo Oh, hopefully I loaded up a fish photo for us. I did. Here is Kaylee Bristol Weston and Justin Richardson from Bolivia, North Carolina. Uh, caught a nice yellowtail snapper in 120 feet of water while fishing out of Southport. Good looking family. Yeah, man. Good fit. You know, good fish, good family and appropriate for our bottom fishing discussion. It's going to be good, man. I'm excited. It is going to be good. A lot to learn. It is going to be good. A lot to learn. And I need you to pay attention. I always do, Gary. I don't know. You said I don't want time. you playing on your phone. I don't want you watching <laughs> TikTok videos on your phone while I'm talking to Cody. Oh man, come on! Because at the end, I'm just watching. I'm going to quiz you. I'm watching Cody's TikTok videos. <laughs> I'm going to watch a kind of a quiz. We're going to come to you for Billy's best. All right. Takeaway. 
I'm excited. And I want you to impress us this time. I am. I'm not going to come out with just one of those general answers. Yeah, I come you know, out like with. a safe answer. I don't want a safe answer. I'm going to come. I'm going to come with the heat. Something that's never been. Yeah, it's going to be good. All right. I'm going to welcome our, our guests now. I'm going to bring us again. This is Captain Cody, Cody Gardner of Real Time Charters out of Atlantic Beach. Going to be talking to us for bottom fishing, for snappers and triggers. Welcome to the podcast series, Captain Cody Gardner. A pleasure to have you with us. Thanks for having me, Gary. Good to see you guys again, man. It's been a while. It has been a while. I think Moorhead, I think Moorhead Fishing School was our last time. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. Well, man, um, before we get to hear what you have to say about bottom fishing, we like to vet our talent. We should have done it before we had you in this position, but now that you're here, we put it to you. Why should people stay tuned? Why should they listen to what you have to say about bottom fishing, about triggers, about snappers? Sell yourself. Uh, well, Gary, to start, I'm not a very boastful person. I'm not going to sit here and say I have the most experience. I'm a young guy. Uh, not a ton of years under my belt, but I do fish four to five days a week. So I'm out there quite often. Uh, not every day, but I love to learn. I learn something new every time I go out. When you stop learning, it's probably time to stop fishing. So I, what gets me excited is sharing my knowledge with people. So I'm happy to be here. Just want to share all I can. All right. That goes through. I'm on board. All right. So. I think you're familiar with the podcast series, and so before we get to the primary content, we have the two questions, two non-fishing related questions. So I was looking at real-time charters and, uh -huh. you know, the play on the word real. And so, you know what a homophone is? This isn't one of the two questions. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> homophone? Homophone. <laughs> <laughs> a word. Words that are spelled differently, but sound the same. So real would be R-E-E-L or R-E-A-L. Are you following me so far? This is my long setup. All right. So your question, Cody Gardner, spell the word I. It's two ways. Either the letter I or I-E-Y-E. -E. Oh, I'm sorry. It was actually the third one, A-Y-E. A-Y, -E. A -Y, okay. So okay. you missed that one. All right. Second question. And you only get two choices. Spell the word there. T H E R E. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is the other one. <laughs> no. um, is there any way I can win that question? Because I think you just pick opposite of me the whole time. <laughs> I am. I am offended by the accusation. I am trying to run a fair game show type format here. T H E I R. <laughs> Oh, you said game show. I just cute. Or T H E Y apostrophe R E. And yes, Cody, it was stacked against you. You had no chance to answer that correctly. That's what I figured. So let's go and talk fishing. And I think in our notes, we talked about a rod and reel setup first. So we're going bottom fishing. So this isn't a group of focus. This is specifically triggers and snappers. I love specif specificity. So talk to yep. me about the rod and reel setup for snappers and triggers. Okay, and Gary, too, when I'm talking snappers, I'm mostly talking beeliners. Okay. That's what I'm catching most of. I do target other stuff. We catch yellowtails in like 200 foot of water and whatnot, but most of the time, it's just straight up beeliners. Uh, rod and reel setup, man, I'm not too, too fancy. I keep a Fenor Lethal. This is an LT60. It's a really cheap reel, but, dude, I found them to be bulletproof. They've really got more drag than you need. Uh, on there, I've got that spooled. 40 pound braid i keep a 50 pound mono top shot into that i like a little bit of stretch in my setup straight braids a little bit too stiff for me i find out pull a lot of hooks going straight to braid uh the rod is just a star aerial 6.6 jigging rod man it's got decently soft tip not too stiff so you can see your feel your bites decently so what makes it a jigging rod you know, man, I, just, just what it says on the rod, again, it's a, <laughs> it's a rod, dude. I, you know, we're charter fishing. They get tore up, so I can't spend, I don't want to spend a stupid amount of money on them. Uh, it's got a good amount of stiffness in it. I guess that's why it's a jigging rod. Again, I'm not a very technical dude. What about, uh, and so you prefer the spinning tackle to more conventional, to a conventional tackle? 
And that that's a chart, another charter thing for me. Uh, customers find that more comfortable. They don't have to keep a thumb on the spool. Me personally, I am more comfortable with a conventional. I like using the conventional better, but for clients, I just keep spinning rods on the boat mainly. Okay. So I think number two was rigs. So we've got our rod and reel set up. Talk to me about some rigs. Okay. My rig. Now, there's a ton of different ways to do this. They all work. You know, for a long time, I just fished a four-foot chicken rig with two hooks. I don't know if everybody's familiar with, I'm not even sure what the knot is called, man, but you make big old dropper loops in them that you can slide hooks on and off to. The good thing about those is those dropper loops stay stiff. And they keep your bait out away from the rig, and it doesn't normally get tangled. My only beef with that rig and why I moved away from it is because if you jack it up, then you've got to tie another one, and that takes time away from you. So what I've started doing is taking probably, I don't know, it's about four foot of 100-pound mono to those crimp-on swivels. And then off of that, I'm running probably a foot of 60-pound mono to a Mustad Demon Perfect Circle Hook. The number on that circle hook is a 39951 NPBM. The circle hook, you're not having to jerk. Uh, you can just reel into the fish, and the fish is there. Uh, why I like that setup the most is because I keep a pool noodle with those one foot branches with that hook on there and I can pre-make 50 of them, stick them all in that pool noodle. And instead of with the dropper loop rig, when you get, when you mess it up, you don't have to tie a whole new rig or clip it on. You just simply replace a branch into that, uh, that swivel here. Just, just a lot faster for me, a lot easier to use quick changing in and out. And you say that's about a four foot rig too. Yeah, about a four foot rig with uh, you know one foot branches off of it. So the uh, the swivels are how far it. apart? There's two swivels that'll hold the two hooks. They're about how far apart? They're probably two foot, two foot apart. You know, just space it all out so that your hooks aren't going to tangle with each other on the way down. All right, and so that's it, man. It's as simple as that rig. You're not using anything else, and that is what's working for you. All right, I that's mean. Man, just snap swivel it in. You got two loops in the end. Obviously, top loop smaller. Put your snap swivel on. Bottom loop's bigger, so you can put a sash weight on it. And then I think bait was in the notes. We we're going to talk about bait for this bottom fishing. Yep. So my preferred is a Humboldt Squid Wing. Uh, you can buy them. They come in a bunch of different shops. So anyway, cutting them up. Uh, Thumbnail size pieces, that's a really durable bait. It doesn't get jerked off very bad at all. So that's why I like that the most. Most fish seem to like it. Triggers like it. Beeliners like it. But I do have days where they don't want to eat that. Uh, so, I'll, you know, if you can catch an albacore, chunk him up, that's always a good bait. And then something else I always switch to is a uh, Boston mackerel. I'll fillet the sides off of him. Dice him up, and again, little thumbnail size pieces. And there's some days when they won't touch squid, they won't touch albacore, but they will eat a mackerel. So I always like to have options. So the squid you like because of the durability? Is that what you said? Is that? And then is there a reason why you specifically named Humboldt squid? Or no, that's just what the that's you know that's where a squid wing comes from, a Humboldt squid. Okay. And yeah, that's preferred just because it's so durable. The albacore is really durable too, but the Boston mackerel is not. That is a mushy, mushy fish, but I get a lot of bites on it. So if you're hooking a Boston mackerel, what are you doing? Are you going making sure the like skin is on the outside? The you, it's the first thing to go through the hook. Is you want plenty of hooks showing? Yeah. So uh, you know, fillet fillet the sides off of them. Get your little squares. Uh, for triggers, obviously you want a little bit smaller bait. They got really tiny mouths. They're good thieves. They're about like a sheep's head is in shore. They can steal your bait real quick. Uh, I do not, if I'm trigger fishing, I do not like to put giant pieces. Uh, if you foul up, I only like to really hook them once or twice too. If you hook it too many times with that circle hook and the bait gets all rolled up on itself and it's covering the tip, uh, your hookup ratio is going to go down. All right. So we've got a rod and reel. We've got some terminal tackle and we've got some bait. 
but we got to find the fish. Help us find the fish. Yep. So I'm mostly fishing ledges, uh, hard bottom rock ledges. These ledges can be anywhere from, you know, two, three foot of relief on up to 10, 15. Me personally, I like to fish the smaller ones. Uh, how am I finding these? You can do your homework. You can go look at pull up public numbers. Uh, I believe chasing tails has a lot of public numbers on their site. That's all good. But, uh, most of my best spots have been found uh, running to and from home, really paying attention to your bottom finder. Uh, you may not get to fish that spot that particular day that you find it, but keep it in the back of your mind. Uh, when you do fish in an area that you've marked some spots and uh, never got a chance to fish it, take a, take a day, take an hour, or something like that, and go explore those spots. That's something off the beaten path that most people aren't fishing probably if it's out away from those most those beat up numbers. So, so really all of, for you, all about ledges. So we're not fishing wrecks. We're not fishing ARs, not even really fishing necessarily live bottom, but you like ledges. I do like ledges, man. I'll fish wrecks. I'll fish ARs. Uh, most of our, most of the ARs I fish are a little bit too shallow. There is one AR, I think trying to think there's AR right behind right beside the two ten rock that I fish every now and then. Uh, my only thing with that is I'm just getting broke off a lot. Charter fishing, uh, people getting stuck in it, dragging their weight across it. Just ledges seem to be more productive for me. So f- as far as the ledges go, for our you know, bee liners and triggers, and I don't know if this changes, maybe you can even speak a little bit about the changing of the seasons. Like what's the minimum water depth what's the maximum water depth like what's the best range and i you're you're fishing out of atlantic beach and you know how well do you think your experience in atlantic beach applies up and down the north carolina coast i would think it would apply pretty well to mostly our coast uh depth wise i'm normally in the 100 foot ballpark i have caught bee liners uh dude like inwards of 60 70 foot but it's kind of rare most days I'm finding them in 100 foot. I have found them out 200 plus, but uh, that's really deep. That's a lot of cranking. 100 foot's uh, my main area, bee liner fishing. 100, 110 foot, something like that. Help me, help me get set up on the ledge. What, what strategy, what tactic do I need to get in the, you know, in the best position if I found my two to three foot relief, you know, to 10 to 15 foot relief? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'll usually pull up to a spot, I'll stay in neutral, and I'll make a couple drifts, figure out how I'm drifting, and then I know a lot of guys that anchor. I personally, I don't anchor. I'd like to get into it a little bit. I think it may would help, but I just haven't done that a lot, so I'm typically finding that drift, uh, putting my stern into the current, and just bumping so I can make slow drifts across my spots. Okay, so... You know, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, man. So you're not anchoring, you're drifting, and you're con- you're not trying to stay on one spot. You're just trying to control your drift. That's right. Yep. So I'll either get offshore of the ledge or on the ledge, however I'm drifting, if I'm going to drift off of it or over it, and then doing a power drift, bumping the engine in and out, and controlling my speed over it so I'm not drifting to it too through it too terribly fast. And... If you could, if you could pick your drift, if you could pick like how you would best drift over this ledge, would it be from inshore to offshore, from offshore to inshore, or or right down it and not, you know, going down the ledge per- perpendicular or parallel? I guess parallel. Uh, you know, Gary, it kind of depends on the day, buddy. Sometimes the fish are holding on the offshore deeper side of the ledge. Sometimes they're right on top of it. Sometimes they're on the shallower side of it. So. I'd uh, really pay attention to your, watch your depth machine. If you're catching fish on the deeper side, so I'd try to stay in that longer. If you're catching them on top, catching them inshore, try to stay, figure out which one they're holding on. And are you are you tending to see anything on your electronics other than the ledge? Are you looking for activity? Are you looking for, I mean, I know you're looking for bait, but does that matter? If you just see that relief, that's enough for you to start working the area, or do you want to see something else to get you excited? Uh, absolutely. I'd like to see something else. I'm not a big fan of giant masses on my screen. 
Uh, typically to me, that indicates like ringtail porgies, a bunch of grunts, stuff like that. I like a little bit of fuzz or, you know, small individual marks on my screen. Typically those giant masses, like I say, tend to be ringtails and whatnot. Uh, but I do like to see some life down there. Do not be afraid to try out big balls of fish. If you do mark that, they could be trash. They could be good fish. You never know. You just got to drop down and see. Do you notice that triggers or beeliners show up? Is there any telltale sign of those on the machine that you can say with confidence that I think there's triggers down there? Yeah, typically uh, elevated up off the bottom, triggers and beeliners. Do, you will catch them fishing right on the bottom, but most of the time, I'm telling my guys, hit the bottom, reel up a crank or two, three or four or five cranks, uh, and figure out their depth, because typically they are suspended fish. And they show up that way on the machine? You can you can spot them? You've, you feel confidence there? or not? I mean, I, I'm trying to get a little feel for it. Yeah. Uh, man, I ain't going to lie, dude. My boat is like 30 years old. My, <laughs> Jeep, my depth <laughs> is like original to it. So, uh, man, I, it marks ledges really good. Fish kind of tough to see it. Like I say, I just mark real small fuzz, man. All right. I'm marking asses then i typically try to stay away from it uh but little fuzz marks i feel pretty confident in that okay man and so you got me in that spot and that's the basic instructions is drop down to the bottom but you don't want to be on the bottom you're going to reel up and it can you want to vary that like if you got billy and i on the boat are you giving us the same instructions or you like to hit different parts of the water column I like to start out hitting different parts of the water column. I might have Gary hit the bottom, stay on the bottom, because you will pick up good fish down there, and then have Billy reel up two or three cranks. Or if I got a guy that I feel is really experienced and knows what he's doing, he can slowly reel up, maybe a crank, sit there for three or four seconds, reel up some more, and then once he gets a bite, I'm like, hey, man, do you remember how many cranks you were? Then we'll really get dialed in, and then once we figure out how many cranks you got to be off the bottom, then everybody starts fishing the same depth. Because they'll all be hanging out together. So once you figure out the depth, you want everyone fishing at that same depth. Yep. Spot on. All right. How about, I went, let's break this up. Talk to me about a beeliner bite and then talk to me about a trigger bite. Okay. A beeliner bite typically seems to be more aggressive. You're really going to feel it. A trigger fish, again, I go back to inshore sheep's head fishing, dude. They are masters at stealing bait. Uh, that's a real small finicky bite that you really got to pay attention for. But again, that's why I go back to using circle hooks. Uh, it's really easy for people not to really have to jerk, just real straight into them and typically he's on. So if I'm beeliner fishing or trigger fishing, as soon as I feel something, I'm giving a reel or if we're catching beeliners, I don't need to be as quick. Uh, Man, I'd give them two, three, I'd give them about two seconds and then start reeling into them. Try and let them get that bait in their mouth pretty good and then, you know, start going to town on them. Um, all right. And then when you say going to town on them, I think that was, so wait, no, wait, I've confused myself. Are we talking about beeliners and triggers now? We, we covered both, right? Yep. All right. So okay. are you saying two seconds on the beeliner, two seconds on the trigger, or you got to be a little bit quicker on the draw on the trigger? I'd, you know, I'd stay about the same on both of them, Gary. Right, uh, the only thing I really vary is how I'm fighting the two. You can typically tell, a tri I, to me, a trigger fight's harder than a beeliner. Trigger's got really tough skin. Uh, you can fight them a lot harder than you will a beeliner. A beeliner's got a really soft mouth. So I try to tell people not to pump and whine too bad on them. Uh, if you can just steady crank real slow, that'll help usually get them to the boat a lot better. Again, they've got soft mouths. And then, uh, I don't know if anybody ever pays attention to how you de hook a fish with a circle hook. You're typically rolling that hook out of their mouth. If you really crank those fish stupid fast up to the top, they spin real bad on your rig. So going back to de hooking with a circle hook, you roll the hook out. If you reel them up really fast and they're spinning on your rig, you're, you're pulling a lot of fish off. You're de-hooking them on the way up. So really just a steady pull in. And, and then what about drag? I mean, I'm when I'm bottom fishing, it seems like I pretty much have the drag crack, crank down, but I'm not necessarily targeting. 
beeliners and triggers. Are you are you messing around with the drag, or is, with bottom fishing you mostly have the drag pretty pretty tight? Uh, it's not locked down. I pull most of my drags when we're trolling and whatnot, but I haven't pulled drags. Bottom fishing is probably something I should do. Uh, it's not locked down though. It's not super tight. Uh, you get a decent fish off, a little bit of it, decent fish on. It's kind of creeping off the reel, so nothing stupid heavy. All right, so you're taking charters out, and you're trying to help people catch fish. Mm-hmm. So what advice do you have? Let's just say you have someone on the boat. We'll call him Billy, and Billy's missing bites and missing bites, and Billy's getting frustrated. All he's doing is feeding bait. He's never bringing up a fish. It doesn't happen. And Billy is <laughs> visibly frustrated. And what advice do you have for him? Uh, chill out, have fun with it, dude. Uh, a lot of times we can get too technical and overly serious fishing. It shouldn't be like that. Uh, a lot of mistakes I see people make is how they're holding their rod. A lot of people like to stick it straight up in the air. Uh, that's tough to fill a bite that way. And when you get the bite, your range of motion is all gone. You have no way to set a hook or reel in to a fish really that way. So I'd like to tell them to hold the rod straight out parallel to the water. You'll feel the, lot, the bite a lot better. When you reel into them, you can get some bend in the rod and set the hook. Uh, that's one big thing I see people messing up with a lot. That and pulling fish off, trying to horse them up. And trying to horse them up. Man, uh, so how about seasonally? Is it... 100 foot is the magic number, whether it's spring, summer, or fall. And is this a year-round fishery? It's most definitely a year-round fishery. Uh, and, dude, I, I fish that 100 foot area. It could be out to 150 sometimes. Uh, it could be in shallower. The times I found them in shallower typically be uh, summer months uh, when beeliners spawn. I've just started to pick up on this. I was listening to a captain on the radio the other day. We were catching bee liners in 80, 70 foot of water. And uh, not to get nasty, but he was saying they were full of sperm when they were coming up. So that was something that clicked in my head. But when these fish spawn, they must be pushing closer inshore. And that was late July. So when it's hot, they do push in closer. Uh, and when in the winter, you can catch them a little bit deeper. But uh, 100 foot seems to be my ballpark most of the year. Um. So my, you know, I've done some bottom fishing, but nothing like you. Um, one, one thing of note that I noticed on one trip is when we went trigger fishing, that's all we caught. And I've never been on a bottom fishing trip where you only catch one species of fish. You know, typically I'm used to, you don't know what you're going to bring up. So what is it about a trigger fish bite? I mean, one, I guess I should say, is that your experience? Do you see them cohabitating? Or when you're on triggers, you're just on triggers? And, you know, if so, is, can we make sense of that? You know, Gary, I've noticed the same thing with a lot of other people, too. Uh, typically, what I seem to pick up on is that those deeper holes, 150 foot, those fish kind of scatter. They stick to themselves more. Uh Deeper spots tend to be just one fish, one fish only. Uh, but, man, most of my trips, I'm catching them together. Like, for example, last weekend we fished 100 foot of water and caught bee liners and triggers on the exact same spot. But now it did seem to be that they were separate in different areas on the ledge. I'd fish, let's say, the west side of the ledge and catch bee liners, and then I'd go over to the east side of it, drift over to there, and we'd start getting into more triggers. So uh, they do cohabitat. They might not be together in one school, but two schools can be right beside each other. Anything else cohabitating with them? You usually get any other kind of bycatch? Absolutely. If you get on the bottom, you can catch tom tates and grunts and uh, big porgies, pinkies and whatnot. So absolutely, they mix all together, man. Man, I think we've hit all our topics before... um... Before we wrap up, though, I always just sort of like to say, man, you know, what have I not set you up to share? Like, what else comes to mind with, you know, bottom fishing for snappers and triggers, bottom fishing in general? You know, again, with the goal that people are watching this, you know, they're we're trying to help them out. We're trying to help them catch, you know, as we quip in the beginning, more fish more often. Any other thoughts come to mind? 
Uh, one thing that I did forget, dude, uh, man, don't give up if you make one or two drops, uh, haven't caught any fish or haven't caught what you're after. There's been many a days that I've gone and started bottom fishing, hit two or three spots or hit two or three parts of a ledge and haven't found fish or what I want to be catching. And then, you know, we pull up to that last spot and they're there, the bite's on. And we really get into them good real quick. So uh, don't ride a ledge off too quick. Fish all of it or the vast majority of it because you never know, man. One end might be on fire and the other end might be completely dead. So how long will you fish a spot before you say, this ain't it, I'm moving on? Uh, Man, I'll do two or three drifts on a spot. If I'm not picking up, then I'll move a little bit further down the ledge. Uh, if the whole ledge isn't producing, then, you know, it's time to try a different area, a couple miles away, a little bit deeper, a little bit shallower. And on these drifts, are you usually putting a light line out? Do you get much action on that in this in this zone? Dude, I would love to put one out if I had a boat that I could put one out on. I've got a single screw diesel boat, and she is very hard to maneuver. So I typically don't run one, man. I'm just too afraid of getting tangled up. Gotcha. All right. Um, Cody, one last thing. Any last thoughts for our people? I'm, I'm, I have one other question before I say goodbye, but any last thoughts on triggers and beeliners? Uh, that's about it, dude. Like I say, uh, don't get frustrated with it. I hope what I had to offer helped somebody. Uh, just go have a ball with it, man. They're great fish to eat. That's my, as far as table fare, I love bottom fish, dude. Man, uh, so my question was going to be, I know we typically ask this to all the guys, like, what else, you know, walk me through the calendar year, you know, what else is Cody Gardner doing besides beeliners and triggers? Anything else throughout the calendar you like to focus in on? Uh, man, dude, I'll just do a rundown of what we did this year. We started up in, uh, April, you know, we get that big, hot Atlantic Bonito bite. And this year was really great for us, dude. I mean, we absolutely waxed them and, uh, we get that for three or four months and we move on and start Spanish mackerel fishing and whatnot. Uh, the beat off the beach starts heating up dolphin fishing and dolphin fishing on into May, uh, picking up a couple of billfish, wahoo, blackfin tunas. We got some yellowfin this year. Then you get into summer, and then you start targeting slinger dolphin, baling fish. That's really fun. And then, you know, now we're in the fall targeting king mackerel off the beach. Spanish fishing's picking back up, and uh, wahoo fishing's about to be on fire, man. I absolutely love doing that. And then we'll do a little bit of tuna fishing in the winter. Not too – haven't. I got a lot to learn doing that, but uh, we're going to – we give it a good hard try. Man, uh, Cody, I appreciate it, man. I enjoyed talking to you. Your energy's good, and uh, I like that you were willing to do such a specific topic, you know, like the beeline, snappers, beeliners, and triggers. I mean, I'm a fan of specific works, I, you know, and I'm appreciative that you were willing to go along with this narrow topic, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, dude. Thank you for having me. You got it, man. Talk soon. All right, buddy. See you. Gary, good show, man. A good show. Learning that b Latin language. We got a good dude there in Cody Garner. Yeah, absolutely. Self-admittedly young, but paying attention. And doing the work to figure it out. I he, like it. I, man, you know, learning every day, that's a motto I can get behind. That's good, man. Now, I'm hoping you're learning every day. <clears throat> I learned something very, very helpful to me since, according to you, I pull off a bunch of fish. <clears throat> I never said that. Can't get them to the boat. I was speaking theoretically. I mean, pretty much don't even fish. Pretty much not even an angler. I don't even know why I'm co-hosting poser. a fishing podcast. Poser. I'm a poser. This is middle school. I'm just a poser. <laughs> what did you learn from Cody? Well, I did the learn... Billy's best takeaway. But I did learn the circle hook thing. I pull up a lot of empty circle hooks. I'm like... So what'd you learn? I n don't be horsing those fish. <laughs> <laughs> Slow and steady goes the, the circle hook. Don't be setting a hook and don't be horsing don't, those fish. I know. It's not even fishing, man. It's, don't set it. Don't reel it in fast. I grew up bass fishing in Papa's Pond, man. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Good episode. Good episode. L lot to learn. Uh, 
just a reminder really quick if you guys would just go ahead and head over to our YouTube page and be sure to subscribe to that like the channel if you if you like the channel if you don't then just get the heck out of there um, but leave some comments let us know how we're doing Gary and I have a great time doing this and um, you know having a lot of fun learning a lot as you can see and then um, also just be sure to check out Marine Warehouse and they made this all possible for us uh, to, to be here week after week and, and set up these episodes so we really appreciate those guys so go support them uh if you can with boat maintenance and service and all those kinds of things gary so we appreciate them man. we love those guys absolutely well, it's been a long one dude it's been a long day we've worked hard Learned we a have lot. worked hard <laughs> this <laughs> might look easy <laughs> sitting at a table <laughs> just talking talking yeah but man i know <laughs> it's tough i'm so tired. being this clever <laughs> and this insightful <laughs> can tax a guy Oh my gosh! Oh, I gotta, I gotta do some applause for you, Gary. Proud of you, man. That's all I want. Good Thank job. you very much. That was great, Billy. Hey, you do do a good job. I mean, anybody can sit here. And I go, wasn't fishing for a compliment. Fish, fish. I know, I know, but you do, you do good work. I mean, you ask questions. Billy, you do all good kinds work of, too. I know, man. I'm pushing these buttons. <laughs> my fingertips are sore. <laughs> oh man. Anyway, we better get out of here. Let's get out of here. All right, man. We'll see you next time. Next time. Fishing.